Thanks for coming out on a lovely evening. Would have been a lot easier to sit in the garden, wouldn't it? Are we are we good to go, Jake? Okay. Well, we'll get straight into it. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 16. And we'll start with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, I want to just say hallowed be your name this evening and acknowledge you for who you are and your greatness and, and splendor. God, we recognize who we are, Lord, people who are just human beings who are in need of your grace. And we ask that you would be gracious to us this evening. You would speak to us and encourage us. Lord, as we open your word now, Lord, we will just see you and be made more like you, Jesus. I see these things in your precious name. Amen. Okay. So last week we were in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel. And, and Nigel took us through God's rejection of King Saul. Do you remember that if you were here? Remember, Saul had been chosen and anointed as the very first king of, of Israel. But now we were told that God regret, regretted his decision. We saw that in, in Samuel 15, verse 11 and 35. And you, you could ask, had God just got bored with Saul? Kind of wanted to move on, fancy switching things up. You know, why, why, why would God make such a, 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 well, have such strong feelings or make such a strong statement about Saul that he regretted making him as king? Because that's what it says in verse 11 of 15. I, I greatly regret that I have set, Saul, set up Saul as king. God, as he does with everyone, he, he gave Saul freedom. He gave him freedom to make choices. And, and Saul, although he started out pretty well, he, he turned his back on following God. And he didn't do what God asked him to do. The second part of, 11, of verse 11 in 15 says, For he has turned his back from following me and has not performed my commandments. In chapter 15, Saul, Saul had been given victory over the Amalekites. And he'd been given a pretty simple instruction. When you, when you take the Amalekites, you are to destroy everything. But did he do that? He didn't do that, did he? He and his army noticed that the Amalekites, he had some, some good stuff to be had. Some nice sheep and oxen and lambs. And they decided to keep them. It was beneficial to them. They were being greedy and not listening to the command of God. And, and chapter 15 finishes with Samuel being instructed by God to go to Saul and let him know that he is no longer going to be king. God rejects Saul. And it upsets Samuel. We're told that Samuel was mourning in chapter 15. And at the start of chapter 16 this evening, Samuel is still mourning for Saul and the fact that God was removing him as king. We've spoken a lot about Samuel. The, the book's called Samuel, so he's a key character. You know, how he was a faithful and godly man. Yet we see in his reaction to God's news here, and still at the start of chapter 16, that he, he wasn't immune to sad feelings and disappointments in life, was he? Think about it. He'd invested so much in King Saul. He'd been the one who'd chosen him and anointed him, He'd been there at the, kind of, as he was proclaimed as the first king of the nation. He'd counseled him. He'd been his go-to guy. And now it's all gone. Saul's gone and he's, not, he's been rejected as king. And Samuel's experiencing real loss. He's going through this separation and loss process. And he's mourning. He's upset. However, tonight we're going to see that God had new plans. And, and God didn't want this mourning to, and upset to, to carry on for much longer. He wanted, to, he wanted Samuel for a new task because he had a new king. And we're about to be introduced to this new king of Israel. And although, as we'll read through this, this rest of this book, David will actually become king yet. For, for quite some time, he is going to be anointed king in this chapter. This chapter is about looking forward, not mourning in the past. It's a chapter about what God values also. We're going to find that is actually the heart and we're going to see David had the kind of heart that God was after. So we're going to read the first 16 verse, 13 verses together. It's a long passage, so follow along. Um, 
<coughs> starting in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn, mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If, if Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For, the Lord looks at the out, for, the, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called him Minadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send him, bring, send, send and bring him for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Long passage of scripture there. All about the anointing of, of, of David. And we see, as I've said at the start, God sees Samuel mourning the loss of Saul. Samuel's in a bit of a state at the beginning there, in verse 1. He's probably feeling a bit, a bit lost and hopeless, questioning his role, maybe. I'm just guessing here. But he might be saying, is, is this all my fault? Is Saul's kind of poor form my fault? Probably a place that we can all relate to in, to some degree. When something we've been involved in or someone we've been involved with has failed. But God had new plans and he tells Samuel to get the anointing oil. He's about to find the new king in Bethlehem among the sons of Jesse. And God gives him some pretty clear instructions here. But interestingly, he doesn't give Samuel full disclosure on his task. He tells him what he needs. He says, get your horn, fill it with oil. He tells him where to go, to Bethlehem. And he even tells him the family that he's going to choose a king from, the family of Jesse. But he doesn't tell him exactly who he's going to anoint from among the sons. And it's not uncommon, is it, when God calls to keep a, to keep a task. When he calls us to a task, he often keeps some details from us. We don't always know everything. There's often an element of the unknown in God's work. And that's exactly what's happening here for Samuel. And God does this, so it gives us an opportunity to, to exercise faith, to take it step by step. And Samuel was no different here. And Samuel also is no different in the way that he responds to this task. The way that many of us respond when we're asked to do something by God. What was his response? It was fear. He was full of fear. Verse 2 tells us, as Samuel thought about this command, his reaction was, what about Saul? He, he will kill me. I'm facing death if I go and do this task you're asking me to do. And again, I find these little insights kind of reassuring. <laughs> that even the, the great men of the Bible, and Samuel is one of the great men of the Bible, they even questioned the things that God was asking them to do. Yet, God still used them. God still used them mightily. They were not immune to these feelings of fear. 
Now, God's response to Samuel's fear was actually to keep him focused on the task. He almost dismisses it and says, right, you need to take a heifer and you need to invite Jesse and his sons to a sacrifice. God's response is, right, get on with his task. Just do it. And he says there in verse 3, I will show you what you shall do. Do X, Y, and Z. Go to Bethlehem, take a heifer, and then I will show you what to do. Once again, it's this this principle of the step-by-step leading of God, that God will reveal the next step once you've taken the first, a little bit like the Abraham and Isaac story. Well, what about this, God? Well, I will show you when, when you get to the top of that mountain. And it's the same here. All Samuel needed to do was a thing in front of him, to set off to Bethlehem with a horn full of oil and find a heifer. What a task. To Samuel, he then says, Samuel did what the Lord said. I like that. A few, a few words, but they mean a lot, don't they? Samuel did what the Lord said. The complete opposite to Saul. Saul didn't do what the Lord said. But this is what set Samuel apart as a man of God. He did what the Lord said. And it goes to Bethlehem in complete contrast to the actions of Saul. And he gets there and and invites Jesse and his sons to this sacrifice. And at the sacrifice, Samuel notices Eliab. Verse 6, it says, So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. The NIV, if you read in the New International Version, it says that Samuel thought, surely, this is the Lord's anointed, rather than he actually saying it. I like how the Bible, again, gives these little insights into what actually people were thinking, men of God were thinking. You see, Samuel's taken one look at the eldest son of Jesse, Eliab, and in his mind, he's thinking, this is the one that God has chosen. Now, we can all be guilty of this kind of mindset. Judging people, forming opinions on people in our heads before we've really got to know them. We do it in first impressions. People do it in job interviews, don't they? You often hear quoted that people have decided on a a candidate within the first 15 seconds of a job interview. They were doing what Samuel is doing here. Forming an opinion by the outward appearance. But Samuel was wrong. Samuel was looking at Eliab's physical stature and his appearance. Maybe he spoke well as well. Maybe he had a really strong handshake when they met, or a strong jawline. Whatever it was about his appearance and this outward persona of Eliab, it kind of won Samuel over. It caught his attention. But the Lord says, no. No, don't look at these things. Don't look at the things that that strike you straight away, the physical appearance in his stature. You see, God didn't want a king to be chosen on outward appearance or social merit or the pecking order of the family. God looks at things much differently to the way that Samuel and you and I and every human ever has looked at things. And it's at this moment that God shares this amazing insight with Samuel. An insight that we've heard quoted so much. An insight that rolls off the tongue once you start hearing it. Verse 7. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. And this is important. Important to understand what God cares about. And in turn important to know what we should be investing in. You see, God doesn't look at people's appearance, accomplishment, social standing, and then form an opinion about whether they're useful to him. And God looks much deeper. And he looks into people's heart. And we're talking about the the core of people, the thing that drives them and motivates them. After all, it is the heart that affects our decisions and actions in life. The Bible says, is very clear about that. And that it's very clear that the heart of man is very important. The Proverbs tell us, above all else, guard our hearts for everything we do flows from it. Above all else, guard our hearts for everything we do flows from it. That's Proverbs 4.23. That's enough, just, just that verse. But if that's not enough for you, Jesus talks about the heart a lot and says the same things 
Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He also says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus goes on to talk about the heart a lot and places utmost importance on it. And we see the principle here in 1 Samuel 16 that God is looking for a man who had the right kind of heart. And what is that kind of heart? If you flick back a couple of chapters, we're told what that kind of heart is. In 1 Samuel 13, I can't remember who, I think it was Cliff who taught this. Verse 14, it says, The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people. You know, Saul had already dropped the ball back then. And we were told that, that, that God's looking for a man after his own heart to be the commander over his people. See, the heart that God wants is one that is after his own heart. A heart that cares about things that matter to God. A heart that is in line with God's heart. We left questioning, well, well, what is the heart of God? What does this look like? There's a book at the moment that's doing the rounds called Gentle and Lowly by Dale Ortland. And Dale Ortland says in the, right at the beginning, he, says, he points out that in the four Gospels, all 89 chapters of the four Gospels, there's only one place where Jesus tells us about his own heart. And that place is in Matthew's Gospel. Words from God about the heart of God. And I'll read the verse to you, see if you can see it. You'll know the verses. Matthew eleven twenty-eight to 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Again, well-known verses that roll off the tongue, but right in the middle of that little dialogue by Jesus is Jesus speaking about his own heart. And he says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. That was the heart of Jesus. That is the heart of Jesus, gentle and lowly. The heart of God. And we see that God wants a person on the throne of, of his people who exemplified this character and acted in a way he wanted him to act. After all, as I said, we all act from our hearts. And as we go through this book, First Samuel, and then Second Samuel, and the life of David, we're going to see in many different ways how, how David had a heart that was after God's. As you read the Psalms, David wrote the majority of the Psalms. You're going to see a heart that was after God's. And ultimately we see a, a heart in David that is gentle and lowly. I say gentle, not, not kind of in this soft way that the words might insinuate. But we, we do see him treat his enemies very graciously, very compassionately. But we definitely see a heart that was lowly. Or you could use the word humble. Humble and lowly before God. That was David's heart. It was a heart totally submitted to God. A heart that doesn't fight with God, but was surrendered in trust before God. And we're going to see that in the, in the very next chapter. We've got David and Goliath next time. I'm not sure who's teaching it, but it's a good chapter. And we'll see that in, in those interactions with, with Saul and with, um, and with Goliath. David talked about how he was a boy out in the fields and how he learned to trust God. How he learned to be completely submitted and surrendered to God when, when he was fending off wild animals, protecting his sheep. And the everyday tasks before him. And what's more, God had seen his heart. God had seen a heart that was in total trust toward him and totally submitted to the God of Israel. It was this heart that would pen those words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It was that heart that, that could lie down and rest because of God. It was the heart that wrote those words that there was no need to fear. Even when life took him through the darkest of valleys, because he trusted that God was with him. This was the heart that God was after. A heart that God, the heart of a man that God wanted king. 
Now back to the narrative of this story. Before Samuel even got to David, he had to first eliminate all the other brothers. It wasn't Eliab who was brought a Minadab. It wasn't a Minadab. It was brought Shema. It wasn't Shema. And in fact, none of the seven sons were the people, were the men that, that God wanted as king. He said no to them all. And again, I just got to think about Samuel. I, I like to think about Samuel and what's going through his head. He's it, it, it's, it's been told by, by God to, to go all the way to, to Bethlehem, to anoint one of Jesse's sons and put on this sacrifice. But now he's been told that all of the sons there are not the one. And for a moment, he must have been a little worried, thinking, what's going on, God? I, I've, I've trusted you. I did what you said, but none of them are the one. And he's left probably feeling a little bit confused momentarily. He's asking, oh, have you got any more sons? I don't know what he expected to that answer, but he got an answer that he probably wanted. Because there is another son. But the other son hadn't even been invited because he was too young. And they needed someone, the family needed someone to be out looking after the sheep while they were all enjoying this sacrifice and this, this big prophet coming to town. You see, David in this moment had been subject to outward appearance treatment. <laughs> he was too young. He'd been treated by his family as, look at you, you're the youngest, get out there. He was seen as the least important in his family at this time. Wasn't even invited, but God had other plans. And David was told to get to the sacrifice. We are not going to sit down <laughs> until he gets here. And we're told that, that David was a ruddy, bright-eyed, good-looking boy. And, and I, I read that in the, in the complete narrative. And I find it quite ironic and funny that, that the author needs to tell us his physical appearance after the verse that we've just read, <laughs> that physical appearance doesn't matter. But I think the description, rather than contradicts this principle, actually affirms it. Because what we're told about David is that he's fair-faced, that he's young, kind of a fresh lad, He's not someone you'd expect as king, is he? He's definitely not the description of Saul, head and shoulders above the rest. So we have a young boy here who, who's not expected by his family or anyone for that matter to be the person to be chosen as king. Remotely important or gifted or capable enough. But as soon as he comes to the, to the sacrifice, God says, anoint him. And David is anointed with this oil in front of his brothers, and not just oil, but the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God comes upon him. What a day for, for this young man, David. A, day, a man who just simply, moments before, been keeping the sheep in the field over there. We have a man who, who, was, who was fearful in a very simple and me, medial job that he had. But out there in the field, he'd learned to trust God. Out there in the field, his heart had been changed to obedience and surrender and lowliness before God. And God had noticed. And now he's anointed king. As I've said, David doesn't become king for some time. He's got a lot of battles to, to fight before then. But he is now God's chosen king. And he's going to face some real challenges mainly from the direction of Saul in the next few chapters. But ironically, chapter 16 isn't finished yet. Ironically, the, the relationship with Saul actually starts in the second half of this chapter, after David's been anointed as his successor. But this relationship is, is kind of, it, it, Saul is completely um, unaware David's been anointed his successor. It's kind of weird and ironic and funny at the same time. But we're going to read the last few verses of this from verse 14. And in it, we, we do just see the sad demise of Saul. We see a life of a man who, who's turned his back on God. But we see God using this new man. Verse 14 says, But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and the distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your, your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that when he, when he will play it with his hand, when the distri distressing spirit from God is upon you, you shall be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered and said, look, look, 
I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Therefore, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them to his son David, and sent, and sent them by his son, son David to Saul. So David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Please let David stand before me, for he's found favor in my sight. And so it was, whenever the Spirit of God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. So pretty, pretty bleak kind of verses here, in one sense. The Spirit of the Lord has, has departed from Saul. Remember, Saul had been used mightily by God. He, we'd seen the evidence of God's Spirit upon him, but, but in this rejection by God, the Spirit has left and a distressing spirit came upon him. You see, when the, when the spirit left Saul, he became vulnerable. And God allowed another spirit to come and trouble him. And he'd probably be seen as someone who, who's mentally ill today. Although th this wasn't a mental condition. This was a spiritual condition. Saul had rejected God. He'd acted arrogantly and, and disobeyed God. And, and now he's living the, the repercussions of that and the reality of that. You know, as believers, we've been given God's spirit under, as, as a guarantee, as a seal under the new covenant. And we're protected by his spirit. But, but Saul wasn't. And he was prone to a, a distressing spirit to come upon him. And it's really sad. It's really sad to see the life of, of Saul who once been used powerfully. To see him now in a place of, of weakness and of distress. And it was troubling for the people around him too. His servants, they kind of, called together a plan what we're going to do and they decided that, that music would help one servant had seen David play and, and decided that he was the man to make, bring the music so Saul sent for David and, and gave a gift to his dad Jesse so he could use David's musical services and there's a, there's a point to be made here on the power of music I think you know the music is something that is created by God and is a powerful thing a spiritual thing, and can be used for real good. Especially godly music, spiritual music, or, or we could say worship music. Music, And we see this in the Psalms. The Psalms is, is full of written songs that were played to music, songs to God. And it's likely that some of the songs played for Saul were Psalms that David had written in the field and were as he played to himself or to the sheep. David goes with these songs, these powerful spiritual songs to Saul and becomes Saul's personal musician. And, and as I've said, these songs are powerful and they help Saul. They're kind of a remedy to Saul in these dark times. So much so that Saul develops this real love for David and, and makes him his armor bearer. Real trust there. Real relationship, a close relationship. And it's kind of incredible to think what's going on here. David is still this insignificant young guy who's kind of going between Saul's palace and, and tending the sheep. But behind the scenes, God is pulling the strings. See, David's already been anointed as king. God's noticed him. God's going to raise him up to be the leader of, of a nation. And now... He's going into preparation. You know, David wasn't a kingly kind of guy. He was a shepherd. How else would he know how to be king? Well, God's, God's sorting it out. God's getting him there into the palace to see what a kingdom looks like, how a kingdom works. He's going inside the kingly residence regularly. He's getting the kind of the down low on, on what it is to be a king. What it is to run a country. <laughs> but Saul and his officials have no idea what's going on. Yet God does. You see, God is in all these things. <laughs> Setting up David to lead his people. And again, I love these insights to the behind the scenes of, of what God was doing at the time that people didn't understand. I like it because it makes us understand that God's doing things now. 
behind the scenes, in our lives, in our situations. And what we see as maybe random or seemingly meaningless, God has purposes. And God was working then in and through David, and he continues to work in and through those whose hearts are after his. You see, God still wants to work through people. And he's looking for people to use. There's a verse, another well-known verse that just came to mind. It's not from this narrative, but it's from the, it's from the Kings, but it's actually from Chronicles. But when King Asa, who ended up being a bad king, kind of didn't trust God again, another king who didn't trust God went after the help of other people. God was unhappy. And God says this, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. So God's looking. God's eyes are looking for people whose hearts are loyal, whose hearts are in line with God's heart, similar to what's going on here. And he's still looking. David was an incredible young man. We're going to see that he had his faults. There's no one perfect apart from Jesus. But he's an incredible young man, and, and, and people saw that eventually. Even Saul's, Saul's servants saw it. We're told there in verse 18 that, yeah, he was evidently a, a skillful player of the harp. The psalmist tells us to, to actually become skillful in the things that we do. Play skillfully unto Lord, Psalm 33. But he also acted with valor and was a man of war. He was a brave guy. He was strong. And he was wise in speech. David was, was an incredible young man, actually. But most importantly, at the end of that verse 18, he says the Lord was with him. And David didn't just randomly get selected for a job to be king. He was a man who trusted God. A man who learned it the hard way out in the fields to trust God. And God wanted to be with him. God was with him. And we get a, a contrast in these, these two chapters, chapter 15 and 16, of two men. One who didn't trust God, who acted arrogantly and, and disregarded the words of God. And the other whose heart was in lowliness, totally submitted and totally trusted to trust in God. And as we finish now, I want to encourage us to be that, to be people who would be gentle and lowly in heart, to submit ourselves to God and what he would want to do, because God's looking for those kind of people. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you for your word, or for this, this chapter here, and, and or for the men that have come before us, the people that, that have lived these lives of faith, thinking of Samuel, what a fearful man he was, trusted you. But a man who he wasn't immune to, to, to disappointment. Or for David, who, who, who learned young as a young man to, to completely trust you and see you as the as the God of Israel and the God who rules this earth. I pray that we would have that same childlike trust in you, God, that David had, in you, Jesus. That we would be lowly in our hearts toward you and submitted to you. Thank you that you want to use us, God. Thank you that you use your people. How gracious that is. So, Lord, that you present opportunities to us to trust you. Pray that we'll be encouraged, God, edified, to live this life of faith in, in the days that we live in, to persevere in faith in, in the days that we live in. We look to you, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.